Words out. The taste you love is also a good source of things you need, like iron, zinc, protein, and some B vitamins. Beef. It's what's for dinner tonight. From the Everyday Citizen website, the truth about corn-fed beef. Feeding corn to cattle is simply put, unnatural. And yet most of the store-bought and restaurant-consumed beef in the U.S. is corn-fed. While corn is a cheaper feed and can ready a cow for slaughter much more quickly than a dainty diet of grass, it's pretty awful for the animal. Apart from the corn problem, there's the issue of confined animal feeding operations, where cattle are raised in deplorable conditions including being jammed together and standing in their own feces. A corn-fed beef is far less nutritious than grass-fed, which has higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins A, C, D, and E, and is lower in saturated fat. Pastured cattle also produce far less pollutants than feedlot cattle, as their waste becomes fertilizer for new grass. And you gotta have cheap feed to do the confinements. That's my brand. I just sold these to the feedlot in March. I really don't have many other alternatives. When Sue's father ran the ranch, Cattle spent almost all their lives eating grass, and it took several years to reach market weight. But in recent years, cattle have begun spending more and more of their lives in feedlots. They put on weight faster if you don't let them move. So total confinement, less space for movement. They eat continually, and you get them into the market, into the food chain. We're not meant to be on a corn-fed diet for that long. And we used to feed them 60, 90 days was one thing. Up to 120, you could make it. You start really pushing cattle on a corn-based diet after that, the ulcers in the stomachs don't, don't take it well, and they start getting sick. These animals evolved not in feeding these high starch or things like corn. And you feed a lot of corn, more acids produced, and the animal can get into trouble. Corn in this environment produces these acids, the pH drops, and then they succumb to a condition we call acidosis. And if it's not treated, the animal dies. The corn fed to cattle is supplemented with low doses of antibiotics that help them combat acidosis. Livestock now consumes 70% of the antibiotics in the United States. But antibiotics also help cattle survive the conditions of confinement. This facility, with more than 100,000 head of cattle, produces as much waste as a city of 1.7 million people. A lot of people look at these large feedlots now and, and question whether that's what we should be doing. But, but the reason that it's done, it's, all, it's economic. If you were born in the last 30 years in America, chances are you've only ever tasted corn-fed beef. If the American people wanted strictly grass-fed beef, we would produce grass-fed beef for them. But it's definitely more expensive, and one of the tenets in America is America wants and demands cheap food. The rising price of corn has forced ranchers to look for ways to cut costs. For industrial scale farmers, that means feeding cattle with cheaper recipes. That's uh, corn silage, high moisture corn, which is uh, the yellow kernels you see, and then we feed some byproducts, potato chips, uh, and a chocolate blend, um, which is, uh, has some cocoa shells. Uh, uh, you see some M&Ms uh, with it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct from uh, Hershey and MMRs. 
Feeding cows a diet of fast food is just the beginning. The funny thing about this is that cows aren't naturally corn-eating animals. Never mind corn mixed with M&Ms and potato chips. Here, girls. Cows naturally feed off of grass. And 150 miles north of the Nisley Ranch, Ron Kipps raises his cattle in exactly this way. We do what they call rotational grazing. Because raising grass-fed cows for mass consumption is considered inefficient. For the number of cattle that we're feeding, we couldn't grass feed cattle here. We can get more off an acre by growing crops, corn, and soybeans and small grain than we could by putting cattle on. For one thing, grass-fed cows take longer to reach market weight. They also require much larger parcels of land for grazing. And on Ron's grass farm, there's only enough land for 100 cattle. To make a profit, he has to charge about 30% more than the Nisley brothers. But there are benefits to grass-fed beef. Studies show that grass-fed cattle are richer in vitamins and omega-3 fatty acids compared to conventionally raised beef. And there's no need for petroleum-based fertilizer to grow the corn feed. Cows have their own special way of fertilizing the land. And then there's the taste issue. Because of the abundance of corn-fed cattle, most Americans are used to beef that has a high fat content. Uh, I don't know if I ever had grass-fed, uh, strictly grass-fed beef. To advocates of conventionally raised beef, the higher fat content is said to give the meat its flavor. Though, in some cases, one has to wonder if that's the natural flavor of meat or the M&Ms you're tasting. On February 11, 2009, CBS News reported, Link eyed between beef and cancer. In feedlots across the country, beef cattle are given growth hormones to make them fatter faster to save money. Now questions are being raised about one of the most widely used hormones, Xeranol, a synthetic estrogen implanted in cattle. A series of tests done for the Pentagon show a possible link between breast cancer and Xeranol. New evidence again of the Food and Drug Administration's failure to protect American consumers from dangerous products. For months now, the FDA has insisted that uh, bisphenol A, it's a chemical found in plastic items, BPA, is safe. Now, a scathing new report reveals that the FDA ignored important, critical evidence of BPA's dangers. Not only should we be concerned about what is in our foods, we also need to be concerned about what is on the outside of our foods. Today's modern foods are neatly packed and wrapped in plastics, styrofoam, tin, and aluminum. On March 30, 2011, Discovery News reported, food packaging harbors harmful chemicals. Plastic wrappers, food cans, and storage tubs deposit at least two potentially harmful chemicals into our food, confirmed a new study. By cutting out containers, people can dramatically reduce their exposures to these toxins. The chemicals, bisphenol A, or BPA, and a phthalate called DEHP, are known to disrupt hormonal systems in the bodies of both animals and people, leading to developmental and reproductive problems as well as cancers, heart disease, and brain disorders. And both appear in a wide variety of food packaging materials. But when people in the new study avoided plastic and ate mostly fresh foods for just three days, the levels of these chemicals in their bodies dropped by more than 50 percent, and sometimes much more. On November 8, 2010, Discovery News reported, Canned Food Alert. There are traces of the worrisome chemical BPA in a wide variety of canned foods from supermarket shelves, found a new study. BPA is also present in products packaged in plastic and in one sample from the deli counter. The study, which was the first to measure levels of BPA in grocery store foods in the United States, suggests that food, especially canned food, might be one major route the BPA uses to get into our bodies. 
BPA has been linked to all sorts of health concerns, including heart disease, cancers, and developmental problems. On February 15, 2010, USA Today reported that the FDA said it has some concerns about health effects and encouraged people to limit their exposure. Research has linked the chemical to cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, sexual dysfunction, and early onset puberty. FDA officials said they are especially concerned about its developmental impact on fetuses, infants, and young children. BPA used to harden plastics leaches from containers into food and drinks, even cold ones. It's so ubiquitous that more than 90% of Americans have traces of it in their urine, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. To eat well in this country costs more than to eat badly. It will take more money, and some people simply don't have it. And that's one of the reasons that we need changes at the policy level, so that the carrots are a better deal than the chips. We all know that fast food and junk foods are not the healthiest of meals, but based on recent studies, research, and testing, what we often thought of as healthy foods are not as healthy as we have been led to believe. The food processing manufacturers appear to be more concerned with profits than the health and well-being of their customers and the Food and Drug Administration appears to be more concerned with the interests of the manufacturers than the American people. Because the manufacturers and the government ignore our concerns, it is going to be our responsibility to take charge of our nutrition and well-being. Our grandparents and their parents before them had one primary objective, the production and preservation of food. Every aspect of life revolved around this one goal. Today, however, our focus is on the television, sports, games, or hobbies, and food has been relegated to an afterthought. There are a few alternatives to the chemically laden foods available at your local supermarket. You can buy organic, which unfortunately, because of the current economics of food production, is more expensive. Or, you can grow and raise your own food, which is time-consuming and hard work. But you have to ask yourself, is it worth improving the health of my family? If your diet and health is important to you, you will want to watch these eye-opening and heart-stopping documentaries on the truth about the foods we buy and eat every day.